Hi, this is Divyansh Kaushik. Uh, welcome back to 11747 Neural Networks for NLP. Uh, today we will be talking about bias in NLP models. Uh, so for years, uh, our community has been training models successfully to exploit any signal in the input data to make accurate predictions that generalize even to unseen data from the same distribution. Uh, however, researchers and the public more broadly have grown alarmed that these models do not know what truly makes a label applicable, uh, instead relying on any signal, including so-called spurious associations, to make accurate predictions. Uh, however, these terms hold no formal meaning in the standard ML framework. Uh, you know, it's, it's not clear what precisely constitutes the spurious correlation or why a model should not rely on it in the first place. Uh, but there are some features uh, that we as humans know are wrong for us to rely upon in certain decision-making contexts, uh, such as relying upon one's gender uh, to determine whether we should offer them a computer programming job or not would be wrong. So why are these issues important to discuss from a modeling context? Well, there's the idea of procedural fairness that decisions should be based on uh, qualifications not on distant proxies uh, that are spurously correlated with the outcome of interest. Uh, you know, if you train a model to predict whether to hire someone, but it turns out that the training data has historical societal biases encoded in it, uh, it would be wrong for the resulting model to rely on various attributes like age or gender or race or you know, nationality of a person in determining whether they should be hired for a job or not. Uh, and similarly, we have the idea of distribution shift that we expect our models to not fail under unseen distributions. So consider the simple example of sentiment analysis. Uh, you know, if you train a sentiment analysis model on movie reviews and it assigns say positive sentiment to words uh, indicating romantic genre and negative sentiment to words indicating horror genre. Uh, now those models would break if you deploy them in different settings, say on kitchen appliances, where words like horror or romance uh, have no meaning. So what kind of issues do we broadly observe in NLP? Well, for one, uh, some of our training tasks may fail to represent reality. For instance, in this paper, we uh, showed that passage-based question answering models, well, we expect them uh, you know, we expect models to look at both passages and questions uh, before they predict the correct answer. But it turns out that these models can actually predict the answers by ignoring questions altogether. And in another paper, uh, it was shown that in similar uh, settings in passage-based question answering, if you add a distractor phrase at the end of the passage, and the distractor phrase has nothing to do with whatever else is being said in the passage, uh, and, and you pass on that uh, passage and the question to the model, uh, the model often flips its predictions altogether, which is concerning. Uh, then there's bias towards protected attributes. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, it was found that when translating gender neutral Turkish sentences into English, uh, Google associates, uh, he, she pronouns with predominantly uh, and stereotypically male, female dominated jobs. Uh, like she's a cook, he's an engineer, he's a doctor, she's a nurse, uh, he's a cleaner, uh, she's a teacher, etc. And then we have biases and human annotation. Uh, for example, researchers have found that uh, toxicity classification data sets are biased against the LGBTQ community. Uh, and these types of biases can arise from a combination of possibly underspecified annotation guidelines where crowd workers either do not understand what the task entails or you know, may not know what is, being, what is expected of them. Uh, and it could also come from the positionality of the uh, annotators themselves. So positionality is the social and political context that creates your identity in terms of race, class, gender, sexuality, and ability status. Uh, positionality also describes how your identity influences and potentially biases your understanding of and outlook of the and outlook on the world. So now that we've had a broad overview of what kind of issues we broadly uh, we observe in NLP, uh, how can we go about detecting uh, whether some of these biases exist in NLP models? So we'll discuss a couple of methods in the next part of the 
lecture, uh, primarily focusing on biases against protected attributes. So there are three commonly employed techniques, such as association tests, which I'll talk about in the next slide, uh, counterfactual evaluations, and comparing performance measures or error rates across groups. So one of the methods that was foundational to a lot of work on bias detection was the word embedding association test. Uh, so as a refresher, word embeddings are learned based on co-occurrence statistics. And that it turns out that they do capture some very valuable information, uh, you know, and associations. Like if you if you try to subtract the embedding of man from king and add the embedding of woman, it turn, uh, you get the embedding of queen. But this also comes at a cost as our data often reflects societal stereotypes in that the word woman might appear closer to the word nurse more than the word doctor reflect because of uh, the societal biases that are reflected in the training text. So one way to test the presence of this bias is to consider two sets of target words, say programmer engineer in one set and nurse teacher in the other. And we have two sets of attribute words, say man and male in one set and woman and female in the other. And now we take the data that we have and say compute the value of a test statistic. We'll discuss in the next slide what this test statistic will be. But for now, we form a null hypothesis which says that, well, there is no difference between the two sets of target words in terms of their relative similarity to the two sets of attribute words. That the mean distance of uh, man to the words programmer and engineer is same as the mean distance of the word woman uh, to programmer and engineer. So that's our null hypothesis that there is just no difference. And to identify whether our observed value of the test statistic is statistically significant, we make use of a common statistical tool called the permutation test. Uh, basically we can shuffle or permute the observed data right, by assigning different outcome values to each observation from among the set of actually observed outcomes. So when we permute the outcome values during the test, we therefore see all of the possible alternative treatment assignments we could have had uh, and where the mean difference in our observed data falls relative to all the differences we could have seen if the outcome was independent of the treatment assignment. So remember that our null hypothesis was that there is no difference between two attribute sets. The test statistic here is measuring the differential association of two sets of target words uh, with the attribute through cosine distances. Now, to measure whether our observed association bias is statistically significant compared to the null, you know, whether it violates the null, we compute a p-value. It's basically the probability that your observed value of test statistic is lower than a value you could obtain following a certain permutation of X and Y. And it turns out uh, that this p-value is actually quite low, uh, quite small. And these word embeddings do indeed exhibit societal stereotypes or as the papers call it, uh, human-like social biases. There's another work in which uh, a similar test is conducted, but instead of using distance between words, they do so at a sentence level by constructing certain semantically bleached sentences that convey little meaning outside of the terms inserted into them. So uh, in this case, target concepts can be say European names like this is Katie, this is Adam, or African-American names, Jamal is here, that is Tia. And attributes can be uh, pleasant uh, or unpleasant. For instance, this is love or this is evil, right? And you want to measure, uh, you want to run the association test on these target concepts and attribute sets. So it's practically the same test. Uh, the test statistic has been modified slightly. Uh, and what this paper observes uh, is that contextual word model, uh, contextual models, uh, Elmo and Burke, they display less evidence of association bias compared to older uh, context-free methods, which is quite interesting. But there was this another paper uh, that came out which, show, which said that it's possible that these sentence templates may not be as semantically bleached as we think they are, which could be one of the reasons why uh, we observed lesser bias in Elmo and Burr. So instead of using the sentence encoding, 
they use the represent, uh, contextual representation of the word. And you get that representation before you apply the pooling operation to generate sentence encoding. So this allows into uh, an investigation into the bias of contextual word representation models, which indeed allow for sentence encoding. And they do find that these models indeed strongly encode biases, particularly racial bias. Uh, you know, and out of the models that they investigate, BERT exhibits it the most. They also find that intersectional minorities may be even more affected than their constituent minority identities. Uh, so put together in context with the previous work, it, these results are very interesting uh, and completely opposite. So, you know, one of that brings us to one of the issues uh, with the association test. Like these tests can be used to identify whether models encode stereotypical or other harmful correlations, but a lack of evidence from these methods does not demonstrate a lack of bias as we saw in the last two papers. Then there's another way to look at uh, how we can analyze uh, you know, whether a particular model encodes certain biases or not. And that's by analyzing model performance metrics. Uh, and error rates have been used widely in speech models, for instance. Uh, the background behind this is the inspiration from US labor law, that the US labor law defines disparate impact as uh, practices in employment, housing, and other areas that adversely affect one group of people of a protected characteristic more than another, even if unintentionally. And it says that's wrong. Okay, so loosely speaking, algorithms would exhibit impact disparity when outcomes differ across subgroups. Uh, and one way to identify this disparity in NLP systems is by comparing uh, performance measures such as error rates, uh, false positives, false negatives, etc., across groups. So in this paper, uh, the authors looked at ASR systems from five companies, uh, Amazon, Apple, Google, IBM, and Microsoft, and found that all five systems performed significantly worse for black speakers than they did for white speakers. Uh, they also found that similar disparities are present across systems when you deploy them in predominantly African-American cities versus predominantly white cities. These are obviously very concerning findings. And then there's another approach that people use to identify whether models exhibit bias against certain groups of people, which is by basically picking text and flipping relevant attributes while keeping everything else the same. So, you know, you would pick a sentence, you would flip, say, the gender pronouns. Uh, so, for instance, in this paper, to detect gender bias in co-reference resolution, uh, what they did was exactly this. They picked sentences, they flipped the gender pronouns, and saw how co-reference resolution systems changed their predictions. And it turns out that oftentimes they completely change predictions based on which pronouns are used, and they the authors evaluate and confirm the systemic gender bias in three publicly available co-reference resolution systems. Now, we've, in the last part, we discussed how can we detect some of these biases. Uh, but once we've detected, can we do something to mitigate uh, these biases in our models? So there are some ways that people have looked at it. And, uh, these include automatic mitigation methods that I'll discuss in the next slide, but also data creation and augmentation strategies like balancing demographic groups and training corpus, or using humans in the loop to counterfactually edit data. And granted that all of these methods are imperfect in nature, so proceed with caution. So there are some common automatic techniques like feature invariant learning or debiasing embeddings uh, or null space projection that we talk about uh, in this part of the lecture. Uh, there was this paper in 2013 that talked about learning fair representations. Uh, so basically what they did was design a loss function to learn intermediate representations that can one, accurately classify downstream task, two, uh, be used to achieve good reconstruction of inputs, and three, be bad at distinguishing across values of protected variables like race and gender. And in a more recent work from 2015, uh, there was this proposal of adversarial training. So basically you predict both uh, the downstream task and another task where you predict the label of the attribute you don't want any information for. Uh, 
So basically, you know, you have your classifier and you have an adversary. The adversary is trying to predict, say, race uh, from the representation, your intermediate representation you're learning. But you reverse the gradient from the adversary to confuse the model uh, and obtain random or maybe majority class performance for that protected variable. So as you can see on, on, in the figure on the right, uh, you see a slight drop in performance on uh, sentiment classification, but your adversary is, no long, is not able to predict uh, race information from the representations you've learned. And that's, that seems uh, you know, promising, but it turns out that there are plenty of issues with these approaches. Uh, one, no adversary is perfect in removing all information. And it turns out that while the adversarial component achieves chance level development accuracy during training, a post hoc classifier trained on encoded sentences from the first part still manages to reach substantially higher classification accuracies on the same data. So as uh, you see on the slide, uh, when training a sentiment classifier on the dial data set, the adversary was only able to classify race with 51% accuracy, but a new classifier that was trained on supposedly uh, race invariant representation was able to classify it with 56% of the accuracy. Uh, similarly, in mention detection, uh, this difference uh, or was 9.2%, uh, you know, the adversary was able to predict race by around 54%, but a new classifier was able to predict it by 63.1%. In another work, uh, we tried to devise word embeddings uh, to, by exploiting the geometry of these embeddings. So basically what they do is they identify a direction uh, or more generally a subspace of the embedding that captures say the gender bias. So to identify, for instance, the gender subspace, they took 10 gender pair difference vectors, like he, she, male, female, you know, uh, man, woman, and computed principal components. Uh, and they found that there is a single direction that explains the majority of variance in these vectors. The first eigenvalue is significantly larger than the rest. So they in remove all information from the neutral words in that dimension. And you can either identify these said neutral words using a predefined dictionary, or they also show in the paper that you can use an SVM classifier uh, that separates neutral words from gender words in the embedding subspace, uh, in the embedding space. So following this neutralization operation where you've removed uh, information from one dimension, uh, in the, you have two options. You can either enforce the property that any neutral word is equidistant to all words in the equality set. Uh, you predefine the equality sets. For instance, like grandfather and grandmother is one set. And you want uh, a neutral word like babysitting to be equidistant from both elements of that set. And you can have a parameter. You know, uh, so that's, that's one way to do it. Or the other way is to have a parameter that controls the trade-off between reducing the differences between equality sets while maintaining as much similarity to the original embeddings as possible, uh, which is called SOC. Uh, you know, that method is called SOC. So the former method, equalize, it has some issues. Uh, like As we discussed earlier, like consider grandfather and grandmother as one equality set. Also consider guy and gal as another equality set. So the equalization would make baby set equidistant to grandmother and grandfather, and also equidistant to gal and guy but presumably closer to grandparents and further from the gal and guy. However, it would also remove certain distinctions that are valuable in certain applications. Uh, for example, grandfather regulation has a meaning that grandmother regulation does not. Uh, and soften on the other hand can be, can be a solution to such issues. But there are problems with this method as well uh, as found in this paper even after debiasing with the methods proposed in this previous paper, uh, embedding clusters still align with gender with over 85% accuracy compared to an accuracy of 100% with the biased version. And so this paper leads to the conclusion, uh, finds that you know, gender bias is still embedded in the representation even after debiasing. So how is that happening? Uh, so they try to observe what might be happening in, uh, even after debiasing is that 
uh, we may not directly observe the bias anymore as it's been obscured, but it hasn't been removed. So the word nurse, you know, is no longer close is no longer close to explicitly marked feminine words, right? But it's still closer to other stereotypical words like receptionist or teacher or caregiver. Uh, and then there's this approach of uh, learning invariant representations, uh, which is the iterative null space projection. Uh, it's a recent paper. Uh, it builds on similar foundations, but tries to address some of the concerns. So the philosophy is, this, is similar that we want to learn a model such that the representations learned, by, uh, you know, the intermediate representations cannot be used to predict the label of a protected category by any linear classifier in this case. So they make the assumption of a linear classifier. Uh, so say you have a BERT model and you take the CLS representation, you don't want uh, any linear classifier trained on this representation to be able to predict, say, gender or race. But at the same time, you want this representation to be informative enough for a different classifier to be able to perform well on the actual downstream task. So the way they do it is that they first train a linear classifier on top of the intermediate representation such that it predicts the per protected attribute with good accuracy. So W is the weight matrix of this classifier C. Uh, the linear interaction between W and say, when you get a new point X, has a, it has a very simple geometric interpretation. X is projected on the subspace spanned by W's rows and is classified according to the dot product between X and W's rows, which in turn is proportional to the components of X in the direction of W's row space. So if we zeroed all components of X in direction of W's row space, we would have removed all information used by W for prediction. You know, that is the decision boundary that uh, was found by the classifier would no longer be useful for it. So, uh, but we also know that the orthogonal component of the row space is the null space. So zeroing those components of X is equivalent to projecting X on W's null space. And if we continue, if we do it iteratively until convergence, uh, you know, that is like a newly trained linear classifier is unable to predict the property, it can help us learn representations that are good for the downstream task, but do not aid in predicting demographic information. The reason to do it iteratively is that the null space of a single linear classifier does not suffice for making Z linearly guarded. And as we see in the figure in the slide, it turns out that the method does work somewhat better uh, and the embeddings uh, look pretty, you know, declustered. Uh, so yeah. And then there's the idea of automatic data augmentation, uh, you know, uh, where so there was this one paper in 2018 uh, where what they did was they, programmat they programmatically uh, altered text to invert gender bias. Uh, so basically uh, changing, you know, Sentences like the doctor ran because he is late to the doctor ran because she is late. And they combined the original and manipulated data. So remember, we discussed earlier in counterfactual evaluation where one paper uh, tried to flip uh, you know, gender pronouns to observe biases and co reference systems. What this paper does is it flips these pronouns to perform data augmentation in the hopes that a new model learned on the augmented data will not pick up on these biases because you would have kind of canceled out those correlations. Uh, the one problem with this uh, method, is, you know, with this particular paper is that there were no substitutions were made, even if names core referred to a gendered pronoun. So there were certain uh, examples where you know names were there and only pronouns were changed, but not the names. So, that could pose a problem for downstream tasks. And then uh, there was this another paper uh, from Zvikrod. Uh, they basically described a data augmentation approach for mitigating gender biases, uh, gender stereotypes associated with animate nouns for morphologically rich languages like Spanish and Hebrew. They used a marker random field uh, to infer how the sentence must be modified while altering the grammatical gender of particular nouns to preserve morphosyntactic agreement. 
And then there's this method of uh, mitigation with humans in the loop. Uh, in recent papers in 2020 and 2021, we employed humans to edit documents to make counterfactual labels applicable. So humans were shown movie reviews, for instance, and they were asked to edit the review right, uh, so as to make a counterfactual label applicable. Like, uh, you know, went to this movie, it was amazing, the story was great, the, director, uh, the direction was amazing and it has positive sentiment, we would show this review to crowd workers, ask them to make minimum necessary edits to make the negative label applicable. Uh, and then we would augment the data, uh, augment the new data to the original data and train models on that. We found that these models uh, are more robust to out of, uh, more robust out of domain and they tend to rely less on spurious patterns. So as you look in the slide, uh, in the first figure, you see that words like horror and romantic are associated with negative and, sent and positive sentiments respectively. But when humans edit the reviews, uh, you know, say for instance, there was a review like, saw a horror movie, it was really bad, uh, and it had a negative sentiment. Now you want to change it to a positive sentiment. The crowd worker edited to saw a horror movie, it was really good. The, the crowd workers did not edit words that uh, that are related to genre. They did not edit the words horror or romantic to make the opposite label applicable. Uh, so now in the revised data set, horror relates to positive sentiment no, and no longer relates to negative sentiment. Whereas romantic, which earlier related to positive sentiment now relates to negative sentiment. And when you augment the data sets, these, uh, like, these purse associations do not uh, appear. So we've seen so far how models encode these biases, how, what we could do potentially to uh, help mitigate some of these biases, but can we also exploit this property of our uh, models to study society at large? Uh, you know, there have been a couple of works uh, that have looked at uh, exploiting this uh, property of our models to perform anthropology studies, like uh, using NLP to quantify gender bias in sports journalism. I think this paper looked at tennis uh, in particular. And there was another paper related to sports that looked at uh, using NLP to study racial bias in sports commentary, looking at NFL, like um, black players were uh, words like giant and uh, were, words like giant were used for black players, whereas intelligent were used for white players. Uh, in the NFL. And there was another paper in 2019, which uh, looked at NLP to, qual to quantitatively study the ways in which language used to describe men and women is different. So while uh, you know, our models do encode these biases and uh, could be problematic in various decision-making systems, we could also exploit this property to study our society. But what are we doing wrong when we uh, perform any study on bias in NLP? And what should we take into consideration as we conduct our research on this area? Well, there was this amazing paper from ACL 2020 uh, where they surveyed 146 papers analyzing bias in NLP systems. One, they found that the motivations are often vague, inconsistent, and they lack a normative reasoning. They also found that there was a clear mismatch between motivations and proposed quantitative techniques uh, for measuring or mitigating bias. And they also found that papers often do not engage with relevant literature outside of NLP, whether it's in philosophy or psychology, et cetera. So they make some recommendations on how to conduct work analyzing bias in NLP. One, they say, ground your work in relevant literature outside of NLP. You know, be forthright about the normative reasoning underlying your statements uh, and provide explicit statements of why the system behaviors that are described as bias are harmful, in what ways they are harmful and to whom are they harmful. Also engage with the lived experiences of members of the communities affected by the NLP systems. Interrogate and reimagine the power relations between technologists like ourselves and such communities. Uh, 
there was also this uh, another paper from 2020 itself uh, where they took a sample of around 150 papers from the ACL anthology that mentioned the word gender uh, and coded them according to some questions like, well, does the paper study co-reference resolution? Does it study English? Uh, does it deal with linguistic gender? Does it deal with social gender? Does it distinguish linguistic from social gender? Uh, does it include mentions of the words, uh, mention of neo pronouns or uh, you know, singular they? And there are many more questions uh, that are not present on this slide. So what they find is that 22 papers looked at co-reference out of the 150 that they uh, surveyed. Only 5.5% of those distinguished social from linguistic gender, despite its relevance. Only 5.6% explicitly modeled gender as inclusive of non-binary identities. Uh, no papers treat gender as anything other than completely immutable. And only one paper uh, considers new pronouns and our specific singular they. So that's very problematic. Uh, and if you would have noticed, like many of the papers discussed in this lecture also focus primarily on a binary notion of gender. So that's something that uh, we should take into consideration when we work on similar topics. So aside from all the things that we can learn from the, uh, from the papers that we've discussed so far, there are some other things that we should really keep in mind and consider. Uh, and one of them is that well-intentioned works can have dual impacts, uh, right? So for instance, advanced grammar analysis can help improve search and educational LP, but also reinforce prescriptive linguistic norms. Uh, stylometric analysis can help discover provenance of historical documents, but also unmask anonymous political dissenters. Uh, text classification and information retrieval can help identify information of interest, but also aid sensors. And NLP can be used to identify fake reviews uh, and news, but also to generate them. So these kinds of problems are difficult to solve, but important to think about, acknowledge, and discuss. Uh, in addition to the papers that we've discussed in this lecture, I'll also recommend some other resources that are in the slide. The top two papers uh, provide additional methods. Uh, they discuss additional methods to try and mitigate uh, you know, gender and racial bias. Uh, the top one looks at machine translation, uh, uh, and the second one looks at dialogue. And then there are some other papers and videos uh, that I think uh, you all can read that are very interesting. Thank you very much.